little over two years ago and I started my own business. I now own one of the larger microbreweries in Marathali and I'm very happy to share with all of you that as of June 15, we have successfully completed one year of operations and I couldn't be more grateful to my team. At this point, some of you must be wondering if you walked into the wrong auditorium where the conversation is about maybe women in leadership or the microbrewery industry, right? Even my imposter syndrome kicked in when I first heard that today we were talking about the topic exploring frontiers, especially with technology being in the center of it. A microbrewery owner and technology didn't fit, right? Then I remembered that what feels like a lifetime ago that I worked as a data analyst with Schneider Electric for a few years in North America. Then I shook off my fears, put on my business owner hat, engineer hat, and then began pondering over what question that I would like to address in front of all of you today. And then it just came to me, let's start questioning how we can survive in a world where um, technology and machine learning has far outranked human experience. In order to do that, I broke down today's conversation into three big topics. First, I want to discuss if we can use technology as a, a tool to augment our own skills. In order to do that, we need to view technology as a collaborator and not a competition. How do we do that? When I say collaborate, I mean man and machine working in tandem and trying to mitigate each other's shortcomings. When we do succeed in building such systems, how do we ensure that technology that we create is being put to good use? In order to do that, I think leaders, is, leaders here play a really crucial role. Leaders, does it mean that true leadership only focuses on um, value investing in human beings and also uh, at the same time invest in technologies? Finally, let us see when we do succeed in uh, transferring, our, uh, transferring our intelligence to technology, how do we ensure that we use our free time to do some good for ourselves and the society? Let's see AI and how we can use it as a collaborator through some examples. Has anybody ever called a restaurant to book a table? I'm sure some of you have, right? Right, I see a hand raising. Great. So usually it's a lady that's answering the phone call and she asks you for some basic information. She asks you for your name, your phone number, the date and time of your arrival and how many of you would be joining them, right? Uh, let's assume this conversation takes around 60 to 90 seconds. Now let me introduce to you the face behind this phone call at my brewery. This is Sushma and she's my guest relations executive. Sushma fields an average of 75 to 100 calls during the day and uh, along with welcoming the guests that come in and making sure that they're seated at their table in my three floor brewery and also checking in on them. Suffice to say that Sushma has a very chaotic evening and one day I just watched her and she was uh, trying to handle a lot of things and I wondered, how do I make life easy for Sushma? Then, if it's possible for me, is it, is, it, is it possible for me to take this basic repetitive task of taking somebody's information down and hand it over to technology? Then I started collaborating with a startup company which works on voice AI which gives the callers that call my place the same experience as speaking to a guest relations executive. So essentially what this has done is freed up Sushma's like 100 minutes during her workday. Now she can focus this time on interacting with my guests and making sure that they're having a positive experience. And for someone from the hospitality industry, your guests leaving with a positive experience is priority numero uno. Now tell me, has me introducing this new technology made Sushma redundant? Or has it helped her move on to higher level tasks? I think the latter, right? This is what uh, we do when we consciously aim to use technology as our collaborator. Now, this is a very small example and I'm going to share a more pressing example of today. Um, one of the biggest challenges in the healthcare industry is finding a cure for cancer. Uh, Early detection plays a very important role in mitigating this disease and also increasing our fi fighting chances. This is why doctors insist that we get our tests done regularly. And uh, 
There are two cases, by the way, when the doctors are reading the scans where there is a chance for error. One is when there is a false negative where uh, there was a cause for concern, but it went undetected until it was too late and the disease has aggravated. The second is where there is a false positive when unnecessarily a person is put through a number of tests and imagine the kind of financial, mental and physical strain that they go through. Right. And these are two things that we do want to avoid. So I was reading an article in the nature which was published where uh, Google developed an AI system which was made to assist a bunch of radiologists who were reading these scans. And the results showed that where the radiologists were assisted by AI, the incidence of false negatives decreased by 9.4% and the incidence of false positives decreased by 5.7%. And I think these are some pretty significant numbers, right? But does this mean that AI has completely taken over the job of a radiologist? I don't think so. What it has done is it has ensured that the radiologist is able to take on a higher workload and is able to do it with some efficiency. And also it has enabled them to make some free time to focus on patient care. These are some of the examples that we see where AI can be used as a collaborator. Now, let us switch gears and see the pivotal roles that leaders will play in ensuring that technology is used in its full potential. When I was working with Schneider Electric as a data engineer, one of the projects that I was on was to migrate the old HR systems into a new cloud-based software. One of the biggest challenges that I faced was to get my colleagues to be invested in this new system. They all agreed that it was more efficient and it helped them reduce the time that they spent in trying to bring out reports, but they were still really reluctant to move away from the old system that they were used to. Uh, I wondered why, and I think this is because we're creatures of comfort. We make habits that are really hard to break out of. That's because it takes effort, right? And we don't want to put in some effort. Anyway, um, what happens then is the time and the money that we've invested in building these new technologies has gone to waste and the system falls into disuse. Now, I'm going to share some more examples where lack of proper training has caused some real problems. I'm sure some of you have read in the news that uh, the new Tesla model has long wait lines and wait times. This happened because Tesla had a lofty aim of fully automating its manufacturing processes for their new Model 3 at their Fremont factory. Obviously, the goal was great, but they did so without proper training and process integration. And this led to a lot of bottlenecks in the manufacturing process and also raised a lot of quality control issues. It got so bad towards the end that they had to temporarily halt production and manually assemble the cars to meet demand. Imagine the loss the company took during this process. Now, as a woman of color in the US when I lived there, there were some instances which I faced of subtle discrimination, which is why the next example that I'm going to share with you is a little close to my heart. In 2020, in Detroit, there was an African-American man named Robert Williams who was wrongfully arrested in a theft-related case. This happened because Detroit PD was using a facial recognition software which pinged his driver's license to the surveillance camera footage, although there were significant, differen significant differences between both the features. This happened because the software itself was not given diverse data sets to learn and the person that was operating the software was not given enough training. Needless to say, this raised a lot of social and legal complications. The Detroit PD took a reputation hit and also not to mention the ordeal that Mr. Williams had to go through. Now, how do leaders step in and avoid such situations from even happening? How do they proactively mitigate them? First, I think is a no brainer, right? You invest money. You invest money not just to build new technologies, but also invest money in making sure that the people that are using these technologies have capacity building, right? You do that through online interactive courses or do it through workshops or do it through partnering with a local organization. And second is to create a culture of learning. And I think Mr. Jagardar would agree with me that you do it through change management and uh, communication. You use your change agents and then keep a two-way communication line open so that 
people are constantly aware of the new changes that you're bringing in, especially in terms of technology. What this does is when you finally roll out the pilot, it tends to make sure that people are less resistant to you. Third, we also need to ensure that leaders empower people and encourage them to pursue new growth opportunities and learn new skills. Um, this will allow them to become more adaptable to change and also it creates like a bond of trust between the leader and the people. Fourth, leaders must encourage that lean organizational structures because this helps in breaking down communication silos. Uh, they should also foster a cross-functional collaboration. Imagine HR working with marketing and finance people working with IT. This just gives rise to a very entrepreneurial environment and I think good ideas and new ideas will come forth. Finally, leaders should also have the good sense to realize that not all technology will turn out the way that they had intended for it to. And it's okay, but they need to constantly monitor and evaluate progress to ensure that it is going in the right direction. If not, they should be able to readjust their strategies. Now, if we're able to do all this, I think we'll get to a place where we are using AI and new technologies to their full capabilities. Okay, let's assume that we have succeeded in making AI our collaborator and we have also come to a place where you're, we're using this technology efficiently. What next for us? Right? I'm going to show a slide. How many of us have done that? There's no shame. I've done it to my friends where I said I've been busy, but I just wanted to sit at home and watch a movie. And I know my friends have done this to me. Right? Sometimes we just want to relax. Also, I was reading a report on the Global Web Index that on an average, a person spends two and a half hours of their waking time on social media. And I don't know why, but it didn't sit well with me. So from a month ago, I started uh, consciously decreasing my time on social media, which is Instagram for me. And I'm really happy to share that as of today, I spend less than 30 minutes. Now I have two hours of free time on my hand. So what do we do, right? Can we afford to be lazy? Can we afford to do nothing? I don't think so. And I'm going to share some statistics as to why I think it is time for us to act. And these are some numbers that I came across that just kind of made me sit up straight on my seat. Uh, depression and anxiety is a growing cause for concern for today. And WHO estimates that $1 trillion has been lost in productivity due to depression and anxiety related issues. Every year, we lose around $54 billion, which are being spent on physical inactivity related diseases, because this is also growing in today's world where we're sitting and being on our computer more, right? And 2.2 billion people, billion, not million people, no, do not even have access to something as basic as safe drinking water. And not to mention that we're in a state of permanent crisis where there are trade wars going on and armed wars going on and there's climate change and there's natural disasters all occurring at an unprecedented rate. I'm not saying all this to scare you. All I'm trying to do is create a sense of urgency for action. I'm sure all of you knew that this was happening at some level or another. Now, what do we do? How do we ensure that we take our future into our own hands and not wait for an invisible hand to come solve our problems? Because if we keep doing that, then there is a fair chance that we might write ourselves off the script. I cannot give you a checklist like I did previously because each of us is different. Our circumstances are different. Our capabilities are different and our capacities are different. All I can do right now is to stand in front of you and share my ideas. So for me, I truly believe in the power of education. And I think that good education will help our future generations, right? When I was with Teach for India and I saw these people with bare minimum opportunities, they began dreaming from, from being apathetic to dreaming and dreaming to reach for the stars. And I've seen it. And even eight years later, when I talk about them, my heart just swells up. So 
maybe these two hours that I have saved from seeing social media, I will consciously spend in working in the field of education. Now, this can be different for a lot of different people. Maybe some of us have been so busy at work that we've not spent enough time with our loved ones. Maybe we carve out some time for them. Maybe some of us are passionate about a cause and we join a local organization and fight for that cause. Maybe we finally take those books that are sitting on the shelf that we buy at the airport thinking we'll read on the flight but never do and finally read them. Maybe we start writing, maybe we learn an instrument or we go on adventures and travel, right? Whatever it is that we choose to do, I hope we choose to do so consciously and with intent. I hope we consciously manage our time and also live responsibly and strive to move positively towards the future because in doing so we are honoring those that have come before us and also are being considerate of those that come after us that is me with my kids in 2016 when i was working uh, as a fellow in teach for india and they just bring me a lot of joy and happiness even today some of them are in the us and they're they're in England and they're doing big things and they still keep in touch with me and just, just fills my heart with a lot of joy and they give me purpose in life. So moving forward, I also want to vow to myself that I will do more in the field of education and I hope that this also inspires some of you to consciously think about what changes we should bring into our life because soon there is a chance that we might become redundant with the way that technology is moving forward if we don't do anything about it consciously. Thank you.